Hello, good afternoon, and you're most welcome to the latest Cara Connect Wellbeing webinar. Uh, today's discussion is Beyond the Office, Navigating Remote Work in Terms of Employee Wellbeing. My name is John McGilligot from Cara Connect. We provide wellbeing hubs uh, for organizations to enable their employees to get access, direct access to coaching, counseling, therapy, and other services such as financial health and nutrition. Uh, with our services preventative and focus on getting people access to exactly what they need in line with their specific requirements when they need it. And I'm delighted to be joined by our very expert panel today. Uh, we have Jennifer Blake, who's an experienced HR professional with over 20 years uh, uh, operating at a very senior level. Her experience includes Flipdish and PayPal, though she's got further experience in numerous financial services, professional services, and even public sector uh, organizations. Uh, she has a track record of partnering with key decision makers and leaders to deliver on business priorities. And I'm also joined today uh, from India. So uh, taking remote working to the next level is Finbar Buckley, a leadership coach and consultant on workplace transition and, and well-being. He's uh, worked around the world, literally with leaders, managers, helping organizations and individuals to establish effective communication strategies within and for their own organizations. Uh, in particular, he helps leaders to understand and develop their own style. Uh, I'm delighted to have you both uh, uh, join us today. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here, John. Yeah. You're both most welcome, and we're delighted to come at this topic from the two different angles of well-being and uh, HR. And so it's 2023, right? Where remote work and hybrid work uh, are very much part of the firmament. They're here to stay. And in fact, this conversation is very timely because the legislation was just signed into law by President Higgins yesterday uh, regarding the right mm -hmm. to uh, remote work and flexible work. Um, though there seems to be plenty that we still need to get right. Um, so maybe we start with that. And I might turn to you, Jennifer, and ask you, can you describe some of the impacts of remote and hybrid working on employee well-being? Thanks, John. I suppose um, over recent times, we're just seeing probably three key impacts that are coming more to the fore. Mm -hmm. um, remote working in has, you know, impacted people in terms of social isolation and loneliness. When someone goes into the office, there's a structure there. You can grab a cup of coffee with someone. You can you jump in the lift. You You have access to social interaction. And it can be quite lonely, you know, in front of a laptop working each day. So I think that has an effect um, because you don't have those informal conversations, which may seem unimportant, but they are uh, beneficial in terms of people um, being able or enabling people to reach out if they have issues. Um, the second one is really around a sense of belonging to an organization. I think uh, it's yes. much more difficult to someone remote um, to feel that sense of connection. So companies and managers have to work harder to mm. make a new entrant feel more valued. Um, and I think that has an impact um, if it's not done right, that, that people will leave an organization. Okay. Um, and then finally, it's the all on, you know, uh, always on, which, you know, technology has made such progress that we can contact anyone at any time. The you flip, can't escape. You can't escape. But the flip side is what are the parameters around that? Yeah. And I think remote working, because people feel they're not visible or they're working non-standard hours, they may feel a pressure that they need to be always on. So I think, you know, again, it's setting those boundaries around outside working hours. If something is not um, an emergency, it doesn't need to be responded to. Um, and really just respecting personal time. Okay. Um, that's a very uh, comprehensive uh, overview, Finbar, in terms of um, the, uh, the impact in terms of loneliness, impacts in terms of belonging, and the risks and issues around always on. Are there any of those that you would uh, look to highlight, or is there anything else that you'd like to add in terms of the impact of uh, remote and hybrid sure. working and well-being? Yeah, there, there are so many impacts of remote work, and actually it's a work in progress, yeah. remote work it was been there for many years to a certain extent but the pandemic obviously accelerated um the remote work and it's i suppose it has positive and negative impacts on employee well-being there are positive impacts in the sense that people may have a little more time they don't have a one or two hour commute every day people are working in their own surroundings so 
there are benefits for people, but also there are challenges. And it depends on the individual circumstances and of the person and factors such as the type of job, the work environment, and also the personal preferences of each individual. But I suppose some of the common Im negative impacts of remote work on employee well-being would be a difficulty separating work and personal life. That's the thing that people talk to me a lot about because if you're I think working, we're all feeling right that. Next yeah. Door to the kitchen, yeah. 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 And it's right next door to the living room. There's always a temptation to go back and do one more task, one more thing late into the evening, often maybe to the detriment of family time. Um, social isolation is, is a factor. When, if you're sitting at home working all day, you don't have that sense of belonging maybe to a company. And that can have effect on morale. And sometimes it can have effect on productivity in the company. If people are working in isolation, it's more difficult to have a sense of identity. It's more difficult maybe to have um, team building exercises. Also, the lack of access to resources and support can have an impact on people. Because in the office, there's often a designated person that if you have a problem or a personal problem or work problem that you can go to and discuss and will point you in the direction of what support and resources are available. And maybe it's easier to approach a person in person about something like that. But if a person is working remotely, it can be a little more difficult to write an email about it or pick up the phone if they need um, support. So people don't maybe feel that they have the same access to resources and support for self-care, mental health, or no, things like that. Even though they may have, they, they may have them, but they feel more challenged to access them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Access to it is not as straightforward if you're working remotely as if you were actually physically present in the office. So I think that's a very interesting point about not being, not having the same um, perception of the level of access that you mm -hmm. that you might have. So I might um, ask each of you then, maybe starting with you, uh, Finbar, what role do you see leadership playing? in supporting employee well-being in a remote and hybrid environment because if you know it's very easy to say well the the services are in place they've mm -hmm. always been in place um but uh yeah. but employee well-being would appear to be declining uh so what can leadership do about that okay so if you're a leader in a company you're not a leader of an inanimate thing an organization you're actually a leader of people so getting to know your team getting to know the people you're leading trying to understand what makes them tick is really important. And it's more of a challenge in a remote situation where you're only seeing them sort of on a Zoom meeting or when you're giving them tasks to do or getting feedback. You're not seeing them in a less formal situation like at the water cooler or the coffee machine or lunch break. So um, there are different things that need to be done. One of them is establishing clear communication channels and ensuring that employees have clear expectations and guidelines for communication, including by the leader regular check-ins and updates. Also, encouraging breaks and time off for something that leaders can do. Uh, maybe uh, reminding employees that just because they're working from home doesn't mean they can't take a break during their time and making sure that employees know that that is allowed, and not only allowed, but encouraged. Also providing rewards resistant support, like ParaConnect, of course, um, employee assistance programs, and not only providing these, but making sure that employees know how to access these resources and making sure that employees know that the leaders want them to access these type of resources and are sort of, that that's their plan that the employee does it. Also, simpler but physical things, making sure that employees have correct ergonomic equipment, the right desks, the right chairs. You'd have had to provide them if someone was in the office. So maybe uh, asking employees if they need something to make them more comfortable, more productive in their work. And of course, making sure that the employee has all the necessary technology to, they need. Gen Jennifer, also, it, it, sounds, it sounds like there's all sorts of work uh, involved in making this work. I mean, um, Fimber, you've talked about uh, the very clear goals, very clear channels mm -hmm. of communication, making up for social interaction that isn't happening, um, um, additional resources, additional spend on ergonomics. Th there's an awful lot in there uh, in terms of making uh, remote uh, working work effectively. 
Um, is there anything you'd like to highlight or, or is it just a lot of work to get right? Well, I think that um, managers certainly have to work harder around communication because it, you can't just pull someone into an office to update them on, you know, very quickly on something. Your communication has to be intentional. It has to be regular. There has to be a balance between formal and informal communication. So managers have to be more creative around how they engage with their employees. And I think, as Finbar said, it's getting to know your employees well. So some people, you know, the focus between having focus time, having social interaction, it's getting that balance right. So there's not one fit solution. Um, and it is work in progress, because as you get to know your team, you'll know what suits different people, different styles. So, for example, someone, you know, particularly in a sales team, they love social interaction. Someone who's working in a more technical field might want more focus time. So it's trying to respect those different interests and different preferences as you try to engage and maximize your collaboration with people. So some, again, with in terms of collaboration, you know, some people quite happy to collaborate online. Other people may need in-office working alongside peers you know so, so it's getting this... to know all of this so it, it it's it is eating into managers time and I suppose it's really then them thinking what kind of resources do I need on hand to help me with this and also equip managers I suppose in seeing the signs around people feeling stressed or feeling burnout that's even more difficult in a hybrid environment because they're not in the office you're not seeing the body language you're not you know present so it's just much more challenging. I mean, each of you have really uh, focused on the point of of more effort by managers to to manage people, because just to look back at the inputs, there's people have different requirements and maybe different perspectives. You also got to think about the, the goals of the job. Uh, you've also got to think about how the team is working. So it might suit um, Jennifer to be at home mm -hmm. uh, because she's got a, a, a certain technical role, but it might suit the rest of her team if Jennifer is available and, and next to them so that, I don't know, so that they can learn from her, so that they can interact uh, uh, more closely with her. Do we, do, we, do we have sufficient resources for managers to navigate all of this at the moment? And I suppose managers need to look after their own health and well-being as well. So I think, you know, as part of this, they have to role model best practice in terms of balancing work and life. And, you know, I suppose even encouraging their staff, you know, to have hobbies, to have a, an end of day stop, you know, to encourage all these right behaviors in terms of having a positive impact. So to support managers, the organization needs to have Health and well-being is a core value. I think more and more it has to be a business priority, a business goal, so that there is an, a caring environment there to support employees throughout these challenges. So, Fimber, turning to you, I know you you are um, uh, very well versed in employee communication. So, uh, mm -hmm. the picture Jennifer paints of of um, managers taking uh, employee well-being very seriously well-being being part of the core values that's not always the case um so in in your experience how can employees um advocate for their own well-being and communicate effectively in a remote or hybrid environment yeah if you're working remotely advocating can be more challenging but um it's important to set clear boundaries as a remote worker to establish clear times when you're at work, clear times when there's personal time. And it's important to communicate these boundaries to the employer, such as your availability and preferred communication methods. People have systems like no emails between 8 p.m. and 4 a.m., but they're willing to take other uh, emails and calls outside of work time, but not within those hours. Communicating regularly with your employer, with your line manager, with your leader is important. Checking in to discuss the workload, progress, any issues you might be experiencing, that would help stay on track and stay on the same page and address any problems as they arise. And um, leadership is a two-way process. There's the leader being, and there's the person being led. And success in that relationship has three points. 
and they are communication, communication, and communication, keeping the channels open at all times because most problems arise, most difficulties arise between leaders and employees because one or the other has not managed to communicate their requirements, their needs properly to the other person. And it's because of misunderstandings in this area that um, problems tend to arise. So communicating properly your own needs as an employee, your availability times, your non-availability times, also being proactive about your self-care. It's important as a remote worker to take care of yourself physically, mentally, and emotionally, because even exercise, a lot of our exercise when we were going to the office was uh, either walking or cycling if we were close by, or walking from the car park or the cycle park to the yes, office. Yes, you're getting yeah. fresh air anyway. Yes. So that's not happening. So yes. people, have to, people have to make a conscious effort to do that now, spending a little time in maybe reflection or meditation communicating those self-care needs with your employer and making sure they understand it. And from the employer's behalf, understanding that people have needs, even if they are working from home and being um, conscious of that so that the employee doesn't feel like that they're being considered a whinger or a complainer if they're coming up with these self-care issues. Uh, that's a, a fascinating insight or, uh, around the responsibility on the employee to engage in self-care. Of course, we all have such a responsibility, mm -hmm. though mm -hmm. it is, um, I, I think it has become a little bit more problematic in a remote environment. Just a, a point from ourselves at Car Connect, when we send surveys to organizations um, are saying, what services do you think we should provide to employees? What we found very clearly is that organizations that are mostly remote um, tend to ask for guidance on nutrition, which you wouldn't expect. Okay. But clearly, you know, people yeah. who are in a remote environment, they're probably seeing less of, of what others are eating, probably uh, mm -hmm. may, there may be a canteen at work or there may be places where other people go. And and one way or the other, they um, they give us the input that uh, that they want help with nutrition. So yeah. it's not something that, that would... Uh, strike you as the number one thing mm. that people would need, but uh, it keeps coming up time and again. Um, I might ch just change gear a little bit and turn to you, Jennifer, now regarding uh, remote work can present unique challenges when it comes to onboarding yes. new employees. And again, when I speak to organizations, many of them were delighted in February 2020 or March 2020, how well everything worked out in a largely remote environment. Though we've seen the phenomenon of kind of the the quick leavers are the non-onboarders, people who didn't onboard effectively and left an organization almost as soon as they joined. Um, can you say a few words about that and how that can be managed more effectively? Yeah, so I guess, you know, back when we had an office-centric environment, onboarding for anyone was, you know, quite a daunting task, whether you're coming in as a trainee and the world of work is new, or you're coming in as an experienced person to a new company. And I think the daunting has even become more magnified in a remote environment because a lot of planning needs to be in place before someone comes on board remotely so that on day one, they have a really positive experience. So simple, practical things like ensuring they have the right equipment for day one, the right access, you know, the right um, that they can avail of the get access to the information they need very quickly so that they can be functioning very quickly, um, you know, if that's not in place, it's unsettling for someone mm -hmm. starting off. And I suppose it sends a message, you know, are the, are, is the organization ready for me to start work? Um, the other thing is there needs to be a full, you know, I've seen in, in places where there's a really great induction program. So over the first number of weeks, there's a that concerted, can be done. That can be done. That can be remotely. Yeah. So yeah. that uh, people are introduced to the different departments, get an overview of the business. Um, there also needs to be someone in the company that's kind of acts as a mentor mm. outside their um their, their immediate team so that they can ask questions maybe that they're not comfortable asking within the team. Uh, and then they need a buddy in the team as well. 
Um, so it's really around access to information that they um, and also introducing them, you know, maybe there's a weekly town hall, they're introduced there as, their, as, as the new person to the organization, but also give a bit of a description around their hobbies as a person so that they can connect with other people in the organization that maybe have similar hobbies. So it just is all about making them feel part and belonging to the organization. Um, and it's just all about inclusion. So that they feel that they're part of the company um, from the very outset. And I know, you know, a lot of tech companies probably have a head start in this space. Great at sending out your um, your lovely induction pack where you get your all your branded material. That makes you feel, you know, positive in terms of uh, coming into an organization. And then it's really working with someone um, over the next coming weeks and months you know, that there's constant check-ins, you know, you have the huddles with the team. Um, one, I mean, I, one of the practices that I use myself was, you know, when someone joined my team, um, there was a schedule for the first or second week, but I'd have an evening check-in, you know, just how, how did your day go? Or even on the Friday, oh, you made it to the end of the week. We look forward to seeing you next week. So it's just making it more personal and humane um, when someone joins the organization. So, Finbar, uh, communication, 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 mm. um, though a lot of what I'm hearing is really about trying to replicate or, or, or achieve the same kind of relationships that you're able to build uh, face to face. And and that can just be a challenge. Mm. Uh, so how, how, how do we go about that? How do we uh, if we take that as, OK, I'm, I'm about to start in a new organization or a new organization is going to take me in. How, how do we go about trying to make sure that we, we, we can strengthen relationships just as much in a hybrid or remote environment as compared to fully in the office? Sure. Jennifer mentioned mentoring there. I think it can be a very, very effective way of doing this, having a carefully chosen person who has been with the organization for a while, mentor a newcomer, and um, uh, just for maybe for the start, while well, helping them to understand the workplace culture, because each company, each organization has a different culture. And it can be very difficult for a new person coming in to understand that workplace culture when there is no workplace to be in. So I, some companies have found it very useful if again, if it was possible geographically and physically to have a person come into the office, even for just a few days at the very beginning to get to you, get used to what this workplace culture is about and to begin to feel part of the, the team. Again, team building exercises have been common. And again, they're done mostly in person, but again, where geography is possible, still have those team building sessions and invite everybody both who's in the office and are working remotely so that in some way we can formulate them as as one team again that depends on circumstances if you have people working in different countries on the one team it can be difficult but where possible i've seen it working well and it having a positive effect where people can do that um also providing resources for mental health support and uh, mental health, mental well-being, I would say, probably more than mental health, and making sure that the channels are um, open and available to people. Work-life balance is something that is uh, a huge topic in recent times, but for some people, it can mean different things. Mm -hmm. And it's important that everybody understands from the management side and from the employee side, what does work-life balance look like in the context of me as an employee and in this company? But a balance, things should be level. But in the employer's mind, balance might be this way. In the employee's mind, yes. the work-life balance might be another way. So clarity of what is really expected of the employee so that an employee doesn't start the job thinking, I'm only expected to work these eight hours. I'm not expected to be available the rest of the 16 hours a day, whatever it is. And employee thinking, or the employer, sorry, thinking, yes, this person is fully in the office for this, but they're flexible. They can come and go as they wish, but they need to be available in the evenings also. So just being very clear about the expectations of the company for the new employee 
and the expectations of what the new employee has, what it's going to be like to work in the company so that everyone's on the same page. To make a, a clarity in that, that preferably is written down and clear to everybody. So, um, Jennifer, as someone who's worked with many organizations to create their remote and hybrid working policies, um, what's what's the best way to do this? Everything I've been hearing from each of you uh, so far today has been around, look, it's it's not one size fits all. Uh, it can work differently in different situations. It depends on the individuals, depends on the team, depends on the role. Um, uh, we need, but at the same time, we need rules and guidance. So within that complexity, how to go about creating the right policy? Yeah, I guess, so I, as Fimba was saying, something needs to be written down. So, you know, for a remote work environment, there should be a general remote work policy, and that needs to cover the ground rules around hybrid or, or our remote working. So, you know, when people should be available what kind of responsiveness you need. Very much, I suppose, taking into account then time zones, setting how you set up meetings. Um, I suppose also around, you know, what is the balance between having focus work, having um, social interaction? What's the balance between, you know, working remotely or coming into the office? So I think you need to kind of articulate that in a policy, uh, in a general framework. And then it's around the managers taking that and seeing how does that work for my team and build, I suppose, communicating and building the trust with their employees to see, you know, what are the types of hours that they can work. So I suppose it's really the default is to trust, um, but it's really rather than micromanaging because there is a tendency yes. um, that when you can, it's not visible. How, how do you know it's still, you know, you're still getting the productivity? So. Well, uh, of course, I mean, pr uh, companies, organizations are saying, well, we're uh, allowing remote working in the first place. So, yeah. you know, uh, you're, as Finbar said, you're saving an hour a day or two hours a day in terms of commuting. So um, aren't I able to ask a little more yeah. uh, than than before? Yeah. And I suppose the, 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 quest, the, the thing is that, you know, they need to establish what are the goals that people have to, what, is, what are the expectations and the timeframes that, that the deliverables need to be, um, you know, need to be delivered. So it's on results rather than ours so that people can use that commute time in terms of their health and well-being. So it, it's a two-way street, um, but it's, it's ensuring the manager gets what he needs, um, but also that the employee doesn't you know overwork and get burnt out at the, at the same time amazing amazing this has been a absolutely fascinating uh discussion um it's uh there's uh perhaps a lot more to it than uh i had understood before i think we've we've uh dug into some very interesting aspects um i really want to thank uh jennifer blake and Pimbar buckley and all the attendees uh, for your participation. I think we learned uh, some remarkably interesting things around communication, uh, around looking after one's own well-being and making mm -hmm. sure we focus on that. Um, and we also learned about some of the the primary issues that uh, are um, appear in terms of well-being uh, with remote working and some of the things that companies need to do in order to address them. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, they obviously presents both challenges and opportunities, and we've we've talked about a number of the best practices. So thank you to you both for your participation. Thank you, thank you, thank you John. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, our attendees today as well. Uh, feel free to share the recording. Uh, feel free to reach out with any questions or comments or uh, topics or suggestions for future webinars because we're um, uh, we're always planning our next one. And if you'd like to know more about Cara Connect, please visit caraconnect.com. Uh, we're a well-being platform, or we're one of the resources that, uh, that Finbar would have mentioned to enable employees get easy and straightforward access to the support they need in, in order to manage their own well-being. We work equally well for remote, hybrid, and in-office staff. So thank you very much, and wishing everybody a very happy Easter. <laughs>